we've got so much to cover tonight, so much. Um, but let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for all the good things that you put in this book and all the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things that you teach us out of it. We pray, Father, that as we go through it, that you would enlighten our eyes, give us understanding, and uh, send us out into the world to make a difference in Jesus' name. Uh, we love you a lot. Amen. 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 So, um, we're going to start, I think, with just a real quick reading of uh, chapter 41, 1 through 7, no. and then we're going to talk about the Nile River for a little bit. All right, so chapter 41, 1 through 7, it says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Mm -hmm. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine, that's another word for cows, and fat, uh, well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke, hmm. and he slept, and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. I'm going to stop right there. A lot of this has to do with the river. And so, uh, to begin with, I started with a, a real deep dive study on the Nile River. Because you don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. I know that sometimes I'm in denial. <laughs> so... What we're going to do first, um, ooh, there's a sticky spot on the table. I'm going to start with this one, actually. The Nile River is... <laughs> it's going to bother me. All right, cover up the sticky spot. There's something sticky. <laughs> the Nile River, um, as we've mentioned before, it flows from the south to the north up to the Mediterranean. Yeah. Because um, it's upside down. Well, the land is higher where it originates, like in Ethiopia. It's thousands and thousands of feet high, and as it comes to ground level, it, it, it goes down. It doesn't know north or south. It just knows high and low, mm -hmm. and it works its way um, up to the Mediterranean. Every year, the Nile will overflow its banks, mm -hmm. almost like clockwork. Mm -hmm. And when it overflows its banks, it floods everything, and the, the silt from the mountains, the sediments, um, come down, they cover everything. Everything was just soak, 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 soak for a couple of months. And then whenever it finally starts to dissipate, they jump in there real fast. They, they plow the ground, they plant the seed, and everything has to grow in three or four months. And then they harvest it, and they go, yay. It's amazing. <clears throat> it's amazing. So let's learn a little bit about the Nile River. Okay. All right. Um, the river. It's a long one. Is four thousand one hundred and thirty-two miles long. It's only like twenty-two hundred miles from here to Los Angeles. Just saying. It's a very long river. The river is wide, so wide, so that every every second, uh, the chunk of the river that flows through carries. 680,000 gallons per second. The Amazon carries more than that, by the way. I think the Amazon is actually... Well, yeah, but it's in a rainforest. Six... Almost, over... That's a lot. I wonder what the Mississippi does, because it's pretty big, too. It's big. It's big. And the Nile Basin uh, covers an area of 1,312,747 square miles. Give What's a Nile Basin? It's the area at the, at the Nile where everything floods. Yeah, it all floods out. So that's a lot of crops. <laughs> that's a lot of crops. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of crops. Uh, the big thing I want you to pay attention to right now is it's 4,132 miles long. That's really long. Now, 
Um, I was just watching a little video, and the, one, the old fellow said, For 6,000 years, this river has fed our family, and we still don't know the origins of it. And they never did. Because as you would, I'm going to show you a different chart here. Mm -hmm. As you would go up the river, going up the river, there was a series of six uh, waterfall areas. Mm -hmm. So you would have to get through them. And then by the time you did that, you got to the Sud, which is in uh, the South Sudan. And it's the largest swamp in the world. So in the got, middle of Sudan, Africa. Yeah. So the largest river in the world passes through, get this, the Sahara Desert up here, which right. is the largest hot desert in the world. Yeah. The only two deserts ahead of it are the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic, and they're all covered in snow. So the largest hot desert in the world is the Sahara, okay? And then it passes down through this swamp that's over 200 miles of swampy land, and, and then it goes up into the mountains of Burundi. And mm. these are, oh my gosh, the video of this is incredible. They're, they're all snow-capped, uh, where just the, the, the tops of the peaks are peeking through the clouds. And these are all large, large lakes on the equator. The people, nobody, nobody in the whole world knew the source of the Nile. Nero tried to find it. Old Emperor Nero. That's 4,000 miles. And they marched the whole thing, and they tried the rapids, and they tried the rapids. They got to the swamp, and they, they couldn't They're do it. They're like, forget about it. You can't get a boat through it. You can't get people through it. You can't. Get, it's just 200 miles of Louisiana. You know, you just you can't you can't get through it. Sorry. All right. So so here so so here's how it works. This is the steady flow of the Nile. Yeah. It's called the White Nile. I like to think of it as it comes from the white snow. Yeah. All right. So, it, but this is only this is like twenty percent of the I Nile. I was going to ask, and here you go and tell me twenty percent. And what happens is you you have a lot of the large lakes at the equator, and we're going to look at a different map here in a second. Mm -hmm. um, feed into this, and you've got melting snows. Now those snows, of course, come from evaporated mm -hmm. ocean water all over the world, mm -hmm. and it snows on these peaks, and so this is like. Waters from all over the world yeah. gather here, but as they flow through the sud, it's so flat and it moves so slow that about 60% of the water will evaporate as it goes through this swampland. Mm -hmm. So if you just had that, you we have wouldn't a, have any floods. You wouldn't have a Nile. You wouldn't have a Nile. So that brings us to the Blue Nile over here. So this is your steady thing, and then, then once a year... The winds would come from the Indian Ocean, bringing all that humid equatorial uh, evaporated water, and, and they would hit the Ethiopian highlands 14,928 feet up. So it's like three miles up in the Ethiopian highlands, hits the mountains up there, rains to no end. It's like Noah every year. The, they said over 100 people die from the lightning strikes every year. It just rains, and it rains, and it rains, and it rains, and it pours out here, mm. and it's it's 80% of the floodwaters, and it pours down here, it hooks up with this one, and it all comes up here, and boom, and it floods Egypt, <clears throat> and gives them, that's neat, gives them their, their, their livelihood. So here's a different, uh, here's a different view of it, just to kind of show you, it actually starts at the equator. I think you're going to find out how high that was. So it actually starts down here at the equator in Burundi, flows through Rwanda, Uganda, the South Sudan, uh, Sudan, Egypt, and then over here the Blue Nile uh, is going through from Ethiopia, plus Kenya and Tanzania have some of the lakes and floods that feed into it as well. So it's, it's absolutely huge. And here's another... Here's another uh, uh, little map I put together of it, just showing you that it's got all these equatorial big lakes uh, that you know we didn't even find. We didn't even find the source of the Nile until the early 1900s because we didn't have a way to to follow it the whole way. 
and they got up to these lakes and they went, oh, there we go. And they found the farthest lake and, and that was it. And then they had to follow this blue Nile over here into the Ethiopia where it would, would rain. And that is where the flood uh, actually comes in at. Now, because of that, because of that, uh, rather than having, you know, summer, fall, winter, and spring, four seasons, um, Egypt has three seasons. It has Akhet, Parat, and Shamu, not the whale. Not, not the whale. Known as, known as inundation. It's flood. Which is the flood. Um, so the, uh, the, the rains start in the Ethiopian highlands up around May. And by the time you get to early June, it's really, really cooking, and the water's rising. And it'll keep rising June, July, August, September. Kind of levels off early September, and then uh, uh, in October, sometimes it'll, that's when it, it'll have like a little boost, and it'll reach its highest peak. And from then, it begins to recede October to February, uh, October is still kind of tall, but uh, but there, there are some places you can start planting. And so this will be the growth period right here. And, and there, when this is done, <coughs> there is no water left. No. And so then you go into March through May, which is harvesting. And then this is drought time. So uh, to give you an idea, so the Nile Delta is on the same latitude as Florida. That's cool. Or the southern tip of Texas. So if you're looking to understand the so, heat. So it's going to come from Brazil up to Florida. Yeah. Yeah. You're looking at basically from Brazil all the way to the northern part of Florida. It's crazy. Um, so the flooding was foreseeable. It happened every year, just about. Yep. Um, but, uh, but the extent was not known. And so what the priests would do is they would set up nylometers. <laughs> That's what they call them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nylometer. Yeah. It's a nylometer. And they would have steps going down into the Nile. And by, the, by that, they, I always find such cool facts. This is a cool one. And, and they would have steps, and they would count the steps. And by knowing the steps, um, they would be able to give you an idea of how good the crops were going to be. Sure. And if the crops were really good, it was time to raise taxes. Oh. And, uh, and well, that makes sense. Oh, of course. You've got to because you know you're going to have a good year. Because you got to raise taxes. you got to raise taxes. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I want to... Typical height of the flood in Thebes. Now, remember I said that Thebes was... A uh, city. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm just going to show you on this map here. You, I thought you watercolored that. I no, this is actually I printed. I know you cheated. It's yeah. the first cheat I've seen you do. Yeah, I did a couple of them. Yeah. Thebes was down here. Remember that was the head of the of the up, upper Egypt uh, under the Kushites. So by the time it would get here, you would have like thirty eight feet high. But by the time you got the Cairo, which was up here, the flood could be only like twenty five feet high because you had a lot of water going off. Sure. Now what I want you to see in this picture is where's the desert at. Everywhere that's not on the river. <laughs> Everywhere that's not on the river. That is so important. Everywhere that's not on the river. Except for the Delta, which you is got like, oh, beautiful. Sinai Desert, Arabian yeah. Desert, Sahara Desert. It's, a, it's, it's, it's literally, without the Nile, it's, it's dead. It's dry. This, this is a beautiful, is a great awesome shot. shot. Great shot. NASA gave us this one. You can see the desert and look around the river, and you can see the tracks of farmland. Mm -hmm. That's because this overflows. That's where the flooding is. Isn't that crazy? Um, mm -hmm. This just really just hits it home to me, what we're looking at. It's when literally it, just a, a, a million people strung up along the river. I mean, they're just, they just hang out and wait. 2 million to 12 million Egyptians at the time. It's no wonder that... And I'm sure you'll get they to worship that they the worship the Nile because it was the giver of life. Yeah, the god was happy, H A P I, um, and and you know uh, he, he was he was the god of the flood. 
Yeah. It wasn't the God of the Nile. That was a different one. But the God of this flood. And boy, did they just, they did whatever they could to make him happy. Because once every five years, you would either have a low year or a high year. Oh. And, but it wasn't too bad. Okay, sometimes it would, it would skip a year, and that's when you'd have famine, oh. when it wouldn't rise. They could still feed the lower basins, the lower farms, but it was all by hand. They didn't have any, right. they didn't have any pipes and agricultural know-how. No pumps. Irrigation was mm-hmm. like, they, didn't, they never thought about it. So they would, I watched it on a video. They're still doing it, even back in the early 1900s when this video was made. They're still taking big buckets by hand. And they're, they're doing this to put it up into a, a channel. Be like, what are you doing? You know, pipe it up there. But they, they didn't know any better. Archimedes screw, man. The annual flooding of, uh, of the Nile finally ended in 1970. Wait, it finally ended? It finally ended in 1970. Did they move the mountains of Ethiopia? They got, no, they, it was so unpredictable, they built the Aswan High Dam. The Aswan Dam? Oh. There was a bunch of hydrologists, and they said, this is insane. We need to get this baby under control. Can we build a dam that can handle 680,000 gallons per second? You met. It's like an ocean. It's literally like an ocean that it's holding back. And they mm-hmm. said, yeah, we can do it. And they did it. And they put, hooked it up so it's a hydroelectric power. They provide so electricity. Now steady. And now that's steady. And now Egypt's population has gone from two to twelve million up to over ninety-two million. But without, but they still have to have. I mean, they, of course, modern the flood, equipment. Yeah, they like, don't have the silt that comes with all. Well, the no, flooding. now, but now we have irrigation pipes, but and now we, we have pumps, and yeah. we have ways of getting it out there. Here's a here's a work smarter, not harder. Here's a four-line little thing. Oh, flood newly coming! Take from us our bitter pain. Thou wilt be good and dear to us in thy coming, and the day we see thee will be a happy one. This is like from thousands of years ago, written on a rock. Okay. (laughs) Here's another one that was written right around the time of what we're seeing in our chapter today. It said, For seven years the Nile has not risen, the fields are dry. No man buries his neighbor, children weep. When did that happen? And all Egypt perishes. This was written down in 1700 B.C., right after the famine of Joseph. Famine of Joseph. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I've got another one in here. We'll come across it later. All right, let's get into it here, because this is, this is really good. Okay. And it came to pass at the end of two full years. The word there for, for years is actually uh, uh, years of days, two full years of days. Every day was important. Number one, because Joseph was in prison, and every day made its mark on him. Mm -hmm. But I think also because God wanted us to know that we're right around Pharaoh's birthday again. (laughs) Oh. Because we finished up at his birthday. (laughs) Good thought. And here he is, he's having a birthday met. Two full years. It wasn't like about two years. It was two full years. So we're coming up on Pharaoh's birthday again. Uh, That Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. The river. The river. That's the Nile. It's the only river. It's it's always the Nile. Mm -hmm. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in the meadow. Uh, The word for kine, uh, I said it's cows. It's, It's a feminine word, and it does refer to a heifer. A uh, heifer is a female cow that has no, never born a calf. Hmm. See, look at this, all the stuff you're learning here. Hmm. The word for meadow, so, so Pharaoh, imagine him in his dream. He's standing there on the bank of the Nile, and all of a sudden a cow comes out of the, the right? Nile River. No, that's what I do. And, uh, you know, it's like I climbing up out of the Mississippi. Like you're an like, alligator. What are you doing there? It's a big, fat, big, fat heifer <laughs> comes climbing up out. One commentator said this this had to be referring to hippos, the river horse. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no it's, it's a cow. It's a cow. It's a cow. It was it was a dream. It wasn't reality. <laughs> Things can happen. So it had to be a hippo. Well favored. It says seven. Oh seven. Lord. Seven, of course, is God's perfect number. Yes. And uh, it does, and, and we're going to see the interpretation lever later that the seven refers to seven good years. Yes. 
Uh, but well favored. That's the same well favored as refers to, to Rachel to Joseph and his mama Rachel. Well favored, <laughs> just like you, uh, and fat fleshed. Don't forget that. And they fed in a meadow. Now the word what's the word for fat fleshed? Well, we're gonna get there. No. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and it says and they fed it. <laughs> fat fleshed kine is berry. Um, and we're and, and I read here that at the second dream he has seven ears of corn that came up in one stalk, rank and good. Rank and fat are the same word. It, mm. It's fat corn. So we're like, what does that mean, rank? It means it's not like stinky. It means that it's fat corn and fat cows. It's healthy. Yeah. yeah. And this is a two-part word. So it's 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 berry, and then there's another word for flesh. And and I don't I don't care. Okay, yes. All right. And then it says that there was the ill favored that says, and behold, in verse 3, behold, seven other kind heifers came up after them out of the river, ill favored and lean fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. So the ill favored, uh, this is uh, like the butler and the baker, where the word for s how they were looking sadly in the morning. Yeah. That that was looking the these were looking sadly. They were sad. Sad. Cows. They weren't. They weren't. They weren't happy fat cows. They were sad cows because they was lean fleshed and thin. And the the <clears throat> words for lean and thin uh, goes back and forth a bunch of times between rack and dak. And uh, rack and dak. Rack and dak. Matter of fact, just <laughs> because I'm so thorough. <clears throat> Lean and thin are, are rack in these verses and dak in these verses. It just goes back and forth. So what's the difference? Rack is uh, the idea of... I'm getting so far ahead of myself. Yeah, you are. Rack is the idea of slender, uh, s like, like a pulling grass out of the soil. Like you pull something that stretches and it gets real thin. Mm -hmm. That's rack because it stretches on a rack. And then dak is the idea of something that is thin because you've, you've pounded it uh, on a, a mortar and a pestle and you've broken it into a thousand pieces and made it thin. So, so what he's saying is he sees these cows, he sees these corn, and uh, they're just not getting the nourishment. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Um, but let's go back to verse 2. Uh, okay. They fed in the meadow. This yes. is actually one of my favorite things. Okay. It's one of my, my words. Going back to the early type of Hebrew, whenever they still use the pictures. And, uh, and what we have here is, uh, is we have the wall symbol and we have the ox symbol, which means it's a strong wall. Mm -hmm. and, the, and it's joined, which means that this wall, and it, it, it's just all joined together. Have you ever been fishing? Yes. And you look over and you see a wall of cattails that's like seven feet tall. And that's what he that's what he was seeing. He was seeing this wall on either side of the bank. Okay. Well, this this becomes tall grasses that line a marsh or marsh grasses. So, so the same word that's used for all of the reeds and bulrushes is actually used for the grassy stuff that's grown in the mud. And so when he sees these guys coming out, he sees them coming like parting through the wall. Yeah. And he's coming out into the meadow, and, and he's just eating, eating. And he's eating the green grass. Now it's interesting because in the 1828 dictionary, a meadow, think of a meadow, is a land somewhat watery but covered with grass. It's different than a field. It's different from a field. It's not what I was thinking of at all, but it's the perfect word. In the English, at the time it was translated, mm -hmm. they needed something that said watery but has grass. Yeah. Meadow. My backyard's a meadow and my front yard's a field. <laughs> it's a little one. A little, <laughs> a little one. So this word, whenever we see the word meadow and we know that it is watery and grassy, that's telling us that the Nile is, is flooding like, yeah. it's, like it's supposed to. Yeah. All right. So that's verse that's verse two. Okay. And by the time we get to verse three, he stood by the river, and these guys they came up, they stood beside him. It doesn't mention that they're eating in the meadow. Because there is no meadow at this time. By the time the lean flesh guys oh. come out, there's no meadow for them to eat in. Because by this time we're in drought season. Seven years of drought. No, they eat. 
They didn't eat meadow. They ate cows. Yeah, they ate up the other cows. I didn't know cows did that. <laughs> eat more chicken. Does that make them countables? They're cowernivores. <laughs> Counter cowernivores. So Pharaoh awoke. All right, verse four. Uh, I've got to go skip a little bit past. Verse I bet, five. I bet he sat straight up in that bed and went, "What, what was that?" Yeah, because the way that these dreams are. Um, it's like he's living it. Mm -hmm. Because, it, like it says here in, in verse 7, And Pharaoh woke, and behold, it was a dream. That means it was so real that until he woke up, he thought that he was observing what he was really observing yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, in real life. Um, now, I'm going to show you something really cool here, I think, in, in verse 5. This is the second dream. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good, fat and healthy. Now, when you start reading all the commentators and all of these smart guys, they're going to tell you that the word translated there is wheat. But I'm going to tell you something. If I say that, behold, seven ears of wheat came up on one stalk. That wouldn't be rank or good. That would. That's stupid. That'd be pathetic. It, it's pathetic. We're, we're going to start it. Up. Well, you don't... You know, wheat has little things at the top. <laughs> That's all it is. It's like a grass. It doesn't have like seven of them. That's corn. Yeah. The description tells us it's corn, yeah. and your Bible is right. It's corn. Yeah. Um, That's because they don't believe there was corn back there. Right. That's when Jesus walked through the maize, they believed that there was a type of corn like kernels of wheat, kernels of wheat, and kernels of barley. And that's what they think, but not maize. Yeah. They don't think that Jesus had corn when he walked through the cornfield and on the Sabbath day, and he mm -hmm. it says he ate corn. Yeah, but if you type in a Google search, corn in ancient Egypt, do an image search. Oh my goodness, there's pictures of corn in the hieroglyphics. Someone just needs to tell the commentators. They 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 pulled back the green husky part, mm -hmm. had it on the corn, and they used to have it sitting there like that, and you could see it, every little kernel drawn in brown, on a yellow corn. Uh -huh. Anyways, okay. Uh, and behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. We'll come to that later. Oh, as opposed to west wind, the east wind. I'll I'll say this right now that one of the things that we're dealing with is is a double whammy. Climate change. It's a yes. It's climate change. We're not just dealing with the Nile is the Nile is not flooding for seven years. We're also dealing with the east wind is coming. Yeah. And the east wind comes over the desert from Arabia. Yeah. We need that other picture, the one that's got the... Oh, I've got it in here. We haven't got that far. We're jumping ahead. You already had it. No, I haven't. No, I've got a better one. Oh, okay. But it comes over from Arabia, and it's 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 so hot that when it hits you, it's, it feels like a furnace. It's dry. And it just destroys everything. It's so dry. And it comes at hurricane strength. Ooh. It blows the corn flat. Ooh. So they're dealing with that. Yeah. All right. So so Pharaoh awoke. So you can imagine when Pharaoh is having these dreams, he is literally seeing the destruction of Egypt. He goes to sleep and he sees the destruction of Egypt. Well, it's, no, the first one was good. No, no, because the fat kind came up. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. The skinny so, came up. So, so the, what he's seeing is the river is failing in the first dream, and then he's seeing the east wind is coming in the second dream. Got it. So you've got, not only are these corn thin. They're blasted. They're blasted. They're lacking nutrients, and now they're having this wind is striking it. It's just literally, uh, there's a verse later where it says, and, and God is going to end Egypt. It's It's crazy. But we keep jumping ahead. I know, but that's what you would think. If you were Pharaoh when you woke up after that, you'd be like, oh, terrified. buddy, what do we do? Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> um, let's look up a couple of verses on the east wind. Could we? Oh, do we have them? Of course we do. Look up uh, Hosea 13, 15. Let me just get the ones in the minor. Hosea, parts. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Machina, Hosea 15 what? 
13, 15. I was going to say here is Hosea 13, 15. It says, Though he be fruitful among his brethren, and east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. So that's what the east wind does. It dries up everything. Jonah 4, 8 says, um, if you remember, Jonah had gone to Nineveh. He put up, He had a gourd grow up. And then it says, oh, yeah. and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And, uh, and it's, it's that heat. And then look at Ezekiel 17.10. My pages stick together. That's fine. So 1710? Uh -huh. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. And then in 1912, Ezekiel also says, But she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground. The east wind dried up her fruit. Her strong rods were broken and withered. The fire consumed them. And now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty ground. You do not want an east wind. You don't want the east wind, yeah. The west wind comes from the Sahara. It's bad, but the east wind comes from the Arabian Desert. And uh, uh, and it just... It's, to the, the, it's, <clears throat> it's known for its heat yeah and and um well i'll get to that in a minute yeah, um, yeah i'll get to that in a minute. Just get to that in a minute uh the word east as in the east wind is kadim this is the kadim wind that's what they call it the kadim um because kadim means in front of and if you remember i said you always you face east and that's that's kadim all right east is in front of and, and north is left, and, and south is right. And so a lot of times the Bible will say, and on his left to his north, blah, 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 blah. It's one of those directional things that's in the Bible. And, uh, and this is kind of cool. When it talks about the ears of corn, turn to Judges 12.6. Judges 12.6. Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. I feel like I'm doing constant sword drills over here. That's good. It's good for me. It's good for <clears throat> then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. So they were using the word for ears of corn. Shibboleth. Yuck, yuck, to, yuck. to see if, if they could pronounce them and whenever they found out that they were you know it's like people from we always say from Japan you know some people say wash and some people say wash or some people say fly vice or they yeah they can't say ours they can't you know, say they did that during the um, they've done that in every war, every war. Yep. yeah we used to hear a story you know World War One World War Two you came across a spy or somebody that was pretending you just ask them to you know. You either ask him to say something, or you say like, "Who won the uh, Who won the World Series in 1938?" I'd be a dead man. Yeah, you'd be I a dead man. I don't know sports. I don't. Just say Yankees. You're yes. gonna get it right. That's right. <laughs> Always the or or Steelers at some point. All right. So um, or Browns. Thank you. And uh, so the ears of corn uh, that he's talking about. It's the word shibol or shibboleth. And uh, I just thought that was neat. As soon as I read it, I was like, "Oh, that's that thing over in Judges." Yeah. All right. So look what he does. It says it came to pass in the morning. That his spirit was troubled. No kidding. And he was sad when he woke up, just like the baker and the butler were. Ha, 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 ha. On his birthday. Yeah. <laughs> he was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, singular, which I think is interesting, instead of dreams. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like these guys back here, the the baker and the butler. They it says that they had no interpreter. 
Well, it says they they dreamed a dream. Yeah, they dreamed a dream. A dream. Here he dreamed a dream. He dreamed a dream, even though it was two. Maybe it's just a And nobody could interpret it because dream interpretation was so hard. <laughs> the ma- Yeah, it was so <laughs> silly. The magicians were people who um, studied all the astrology the and math and all that stuff. Yeah, it was the magi. They, they were, yeah, they were the tea leaf readers and everything. Mm-hmm. The word is actually this, uh, almost exactly the same word as hieroglyphs mm-hmm. because they were scribes and they, they were, were readers. They were, they the were smart people. Writers and, yeah. They, yeah. All right, let's look at verse 9. Um, I'll read 9 to 13. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants two years ago, and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, that's Potiphar, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. Potiphar. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams to each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, me he restored unto my office, and him he hanged. Now, a couple things from that, because we read it so fast, right? um, is, uh, of course, this is what we just read in chapter 40, right? and we see the baker and the butler. Um, This would be the same guy who forgot. You you never say you to Pharaoh. Oh. You know that he's... Then spake though I do remember my faults this day. That's like if I'm talking to you, I remember my faults this day. Nat made me cookies the other day. It's 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 a weird thing. You never say you um, were were wroth with your servants. His royal highness was wroth with his servants. Yeah, you always use that royal third person y thing mm-hmm. right, or whatever, the he. And so so constantly throughout this chapter, you're gonna see Pharaoh instead of you, or they'll say he. They just don't do it. And the butler here does it, and then Joseph does it. So it's, it's, it's a, a colloquial way of doing things. So, so let's look at verse 13. It says, And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, he restored unto, he restored unto me, he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. He's not saying that Joseph hung him. He's saying Pharaoh did. Yeah. He's, and he's, he's saying that to Pharaoh. To Pharaoh. He's, he's just awkward. He's just using that third <clears throat> person kind of thing. Yes. Um, now, this one, we did. All right, verse 14. Then Pharaoh, who you've got to appreciate how desperate he is. He's sitting on the throne of Egypt in wealth, drinking from a gold cup. And he's so bothered by this dream, they say there's a stinky, smelly Hebrew slave. In the prison over there. In the prison over there, who can interpret dreams. And he's like, send and fetch him. Well, because all of this Magi guys and all of the smart dudes failed, and I personally think the butler is like, not just remembering my faults, but hey, no one else is getting this thing right. I got a shot here. Oh, you do have a shot. I yeah. got, I got a real shot at a promotion right. here. If I can remember, the, what was that guy's name? Jiminy? No, Johnny? No, uh, wait. Uh, oh, Joseph. His name was it. Yeah. Whenever he says to Pharaoh, "I do remember my faults this day," the word "remember" is zakar, z a k a r. And it's the same word that Joseph used when he said, but think on me when mm-hmm. it shall be well with thee. He said, zakar me, mm-hmm. and show kindness, watch this, I pray thee unto me and make mention of me to Pharaoh. He says, zakar me, and then zakar me to Pharaoh. Remember me to Pharaoh. And so he's not done that. And so now he comes to this point and he says, I do zakar my faults. He's Finally, you know, he, he's never forgot. He's, like you said. Oh, he thinks about it every day. He's just been looking for an opportunity. This is a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it's the same time of year. It's the same story. It's a dream. Yeah. And nobody else can it's do right it. It's right at the birthday time. How's he missing it? Even this guy's probably thinking to himself, 
is. Oh, if I don't sing nothing, I'm dead. Yeah, 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 because it'll get back. I better, right. I better pipe up right on this one. So how desperate is Pharaoh, though? Then, he is super desperate. Yeah. And remember, we know this guy's name. This is Apapi. This is the last of the Hyksos kings. Oh, this yeah, is Apapi. Apapi, or a Paphos. They, they call him a different yeah, name. That's the guy. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself, <clears throat> mm -hmm. changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. Um, for two years, he's been in the prison, rot, rotten away. But mm. when the time came, because he's been walking with God the whole time, he was ready. That's impressive. He was ready. They brought him hastily out. You never know when God is going to change your circumstances. And hastily bring you out. And hastily bring you out. He, he goes in a in a 24 well in a 12 hour period right from being the prisoner of Potiphar he's the servant of prisoners being the servant of prisoners to being number two in Egypt yeah in 12 hours could you do that I could. are you ready nope I'm not ready not ready all right and he shaved himself the Egyptians uh, were very very into clean shave they would shave their bald head I would not be they accepted would, they would shave so, so they say that to the Egyptians it's an abomination to not shave, and to the Egyptian or to the Israelites, the Hebrews, it's an abomination to shave. And that's more of the Hebrew. And uh, but they would sh he would have to be clean shaven, and then and then they would have these little false beards that would like they were fake. Anyway, that's the way the world does it. That's the way the world does it. <laughs> All right, and he changed his raiment. And I'm, I'm waiting for that to catch on. By oh, the way. He came in under, changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. So he was stinky. Um, I'm going to bring this up. No, I'll bring that up later because we'll have to come up. Okay. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. First sentence out of his mouth to Pharaoh, the king god dude. He corrected him. Yeah. And then he threw another god up in his face. And then he threw another, because oh, Elohim, uh, whoa. The, the Hebrew god. That's ready to give a testimony. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, and that's why I think God answered it, because he put it so much on God's shoulder. That Joseph was a dead man if God didn't come through. Mm -hmm. You know, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And the word there, of course, is shalom, peace. So, so Pharaoh's going to run down through this whole thing. Um, no, I want to do something first. This is cool. Okay. This is cool. Shall give thee an answer of peace. Shall give. Now, I've been looking at all these Hebrew words for so long, I, I, I start to... I know what they are. Give is always Nathan. And I always think about you. Give is always Nathan. Um, but here, when he says, God shall give thee an answer of peace, he uses the word Anna, and it's the word for answer. God's going to answer you uh, a word of peace. So, for instance, it says, and Joseph answered Pharaoh. That's, and Joseph Anna. All right? And then it says, it is not in me, God shall answer Pharaoh, answer. And remember what we said whenever you double up something? It's like, verily, verily, I say unto you. He is so sure that he says, God will surely answer you and give you this, this answer mm -hmm. of peace, Pharaoh. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, verse 17, so Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to tell him the dream. Yep. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river... And behold, there came up out of the river seven kine, fat-fleshed and well-favored. Hey, like you, Joseph. And they fed in a meadow, watery little field. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean flesh, such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. Now, the word poor is dala. So, I, I want to pull up one of my little... It's, again, it's the perfect word. The King James guys nailed this because the word poor means two things. It means both slender 
as in uh, the threads on a loom that are hanging down, and also poor as in you're dangling your head down in poverty like Mr. Sadsack over here. And, and it comes from an old word that was, hey, uh, the staff and a hanging door. And so this staff, uh, whenever it's with this, represents the rod. It's like a curtain rod that the door would hang on and you would slide your, uh, you slide your door back and forth on. And so it had the idea, it had the idea of something thin that was hanging and it came to mean slender, as in the threads of a loom, or poor, as in just dangling your head down. And uh, it's just literally a perfect word because these cowls are both thin and poor. Yeah, they are. Um, he says, such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up uh, the first seven kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. But they were still ill-favored, as at the beginning. So I awoke. So and I could eat a whole cow and still be skinny. It's crazy. I know. They eat fat cows and still got skinny. It's crazy. It's amazing. And so I woke. And so I woke. Uh, and I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. They're fat little dudes. And behold, seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind sprung yeah, up is. after them. And, uh, and and I put this in here. They were they were thin, withered, and blasted because they were they had no nutrients, they were dried by the heat, and then they had wind damage. That word blasted. Here is a field of wind blasted corn. Uh, wiped out this whole field. And just see it, it's just all laying there. It's nasty. So here's the, here's the other picture from, from NASA. Look at the size of this beast. Beast of what? Look at the size of this beast. Now this over here is the Nile Delta, and there's the Nile River right over mm -hmm. here. And here's the Sinai Peninsula, mm -hmm. and here's the Arabian Desert, and you can see all these clouds. Is that a sandstorm? That is a sandstorm. Whoa. And it is just coming like this. Um, That'll eat the paint off your car. That that will. Uh, they say that there was one time where that just the heat killed two thousand people. Oh yeah, just beastly. Super super hot, and then you got the blowing sand abrading everything. It's amazing. Here's a guy who lived through it. He says in Egypt it is particularly destructive because it comes through the parched deserts of Arabia, often destroying vast numbers of men and women. The destructive nature of the simum or smoom is mentioned by almost all travelers. Mr. Bruce speaks of it in his Travels in Egypt. On their, on their way to Syene, Idris, their guide, seeing one of these destroying blasts coming, cried out with a loud voice to the company, Fall upon your faces, for there is the simoon. I saw, says Mr. B, from the southeast a haze come in color like the purple part of a rainbow, but not so compressed or thick. It did not occupy 20 yards in breadth and was about 12 feet high from the ground. It was kind of a blush upon the air, and it moved very rapidly. For I scarcely could turn to fall upon the ground with my head northward when I felt the heat of its current plainly upon my face. We all lay flat upon the ground as if dead till Idris told us it had blown over. The meteor or purple haze which I saw was indeed past, but the light air that still blew was of a heat to threaten suffocation. For my part, I found it distinctly in my breast that I had imbibed a part of it, and nor was I free from it for several months afterwards, he goes on. Hmm. He just talks about how, how it'll destroy camels. It's just, when it comes through, it just, it literally, it's a blast, like from a furnace blasting. And uh, craziness. Glad I don't live there. Yeah, kind of glad I don't live there. All right. Uh, enough of that. And the seven years devour there. And he says, I told the magicians in verse 24, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, we love how he doesn't even pray first. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, oh, the dream is one. It's a, it's a piece of cake. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The word showed is the same thing as declared. The magicians couldn't show it. 
He says, oh, God, God, God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. Which Pharaoh would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And the seven thin and the ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the, seven east, with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Yeah. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. Now, that's kind of a, 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 a crazy thing. Because what he's, when he says, this is the thing that I have spoken unto Pharaoh, it's one of those phrases that goes like this. This is the speech which I have spoken. This is the words which I have worded. This, he's saying, this is the pronouncement that I have pronounced. He's it's, talking like Pharaoh. He's talking like a king. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. Wow, I, I took it as almost like... God kind of slipped into Fer into Joseph for a second and finished the thought for him. Uh, exactly. The word is uh, Dabar and Dabar. Uh, Can you imagine all of a sudden Joseph finishes it and all of a sudden, I mean, it, it's almost like God just steps in prophetic. and says, and just looks at Pharaoh and goes, that I've spoken what I've yeah. spoken. That which I've spoken, I have spoken. And Pharaoh's like, it's, whoa, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah. Joseph has guts. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So he says, behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. That's the word for end or finish. God is going to, he's looking at Pharaoh and he's saying, God is going to end you. God is going to bring an end to, to Egypt. Egypt. Well, and that would. Seven years of that? Of that. Would, there, there'd be, there'd nobody, be nothing left. There'd be nobody. There'd be nothing left. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, this is the part, like, if, if I was to be asked to interpret this, not that I could have, because we didn't have dream interpretations, but knowing how dream interpretations work, I probably might have been able to figure out the seven years of plenty and the seven years, but I wouldn't have got that, and it's doubled because, dude, it's coming now. It's coming. You, you better be ready. It's literally coming now. So, I'm going to read the, the twos here. We started in verse one with two full years, then we had two dreams, then we had mention of the two officers. Joseph, as we see, is going to have two changes of raiment, once when he comes out of prison and once when he's exalted to ruler. There are two statements of God showing. Uh, once Joseph uh, uh, is exalted by Pharaoh, he becomes second to Pharaoh, and he rides in the second chariot. He actually has two sons uh, in verse 50, and then at the end of the chapter, there are two summaries, a summary of the seven good years and a summary of the seven bad years. And so, this is his second interpretation of it. And this is his twos all over it. So I said... This is the double whammy. The Nile did not overflow and the east wind blew. It, and God is making sure that he really, really gets this. All right. Let's I am see. so glad that Jesus loves me. That Jesus no, that, well, yeah, that. But, but that the, uh, the, the cupbearer guy was like, oh, I remember my mm. faults. Because if he hadn't said anything, they would have had seven years of plenty, followed by partying, yeah. that they would have spent it all up. And then poof, they would, they would have all died. That's that's a that's a hint to us. When there's plenty, don't be foolish with it. Don't be foolish with your plenty. Let me read this here. This <clears> is <throat> this is uh, in July of 1908 was found an, an inscription in the tomb of Baba at El Kab, and it says, "Quote," and this is uh, dating agrees with Usher as well, 1700 BC. Mm -hmm. Here's the quote. For seven successive years, the Nile did not overflow. The vegetation withered and failed, that the land was devoid of crops, and that during these years, famine and misery devastated the land of Egypt. And it's funny that they have a problem figuring out the date of Joseph. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right, let's let's move along. We got we got to cover quite a bit. There's not so much at the end here. Okay. Uh, it says, no. Now this is where this is where Joseph in the yes. Old Testament, the prophet would speak for God, and then walk out of the you, door. Well, not all the time. Sometimes they would, but but there were plenty who would who would say that there was an evil coming, and then they would offer a remedy for that evil. Oh, yeah, yeah. They you would, need to repent, or you need to do this. Yes, yeah. and they would slip into an advisor role. And here, here Joseph does that. He says, God's going to bring this shortly to pass. Verse 33, Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man. Pharaoh did not ask for his advice. He asked for his interpretation. He did not ask for his advice. But Joseph is just full of the Holy Ghost, and he's rolling with he's it. He's not only that; he's also a proven, gifted administrator. Tremendous. And he, he could. This is like where he slips almost into himself. This is his gift. Yeah, this is his gift. His knack is to whatever he touches turns to gold, and he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, because he's got the blessing. He's got the blessing. So he says, uh, he "Let says, me tell you how to get through this." Yeah. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh, you. <laughs> Uh, look out a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. I love that, because it's kind of like saying, <laughs> I'm discreet and wise. And no, it's also kind of like saying, well, you're not Pharaoh. <laughs> you, you need, Pharaoh, you need no. somebody who's wise. Oh, it's I, not, didn't, I didn't take it that way. No, I, it's not Pharaoh's how Pharaoh's a busy man. Pharaoh's a busy man, yeah. So he's just saying, he's saying, hey, you need to get somebody to, 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 to oversee this operation, because this is huge. This could be big. Let Pharaoh do it's this. It's going to be biblical. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land. Now, the word for officers there is overseers. Yeah. And take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Now, that's 20%. That's 20%. But you got to think of this. It's not 20% of a normal year. This is 20% of a super fat flesh year. Abundant year. So it's going to be equal to 50%, 60 70% of a normal year. So they're actually getting, they're going to take a lot of this surplus and they're going to put it in storage. Mm -hmm. And he goes, verse 35, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come. And when he says all, he's, he's, uh, so the, the word there for, um, to take up the fifth part, he's actually saying, and let him fifth. Uh, let him fifth the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's It's kind of like tithe, but it's. But it's a double word. It's like mm -hmm. a double tie. The, it's a taxation word. So he's saying tax them. Gather it up. Get it. We know it's coming. Remember? The, yeah. the floods are coming. Raise the taxes. So he's going to, he said, raise it to 20%. They never tax But it's more. not just taxes of money. We're actually going to no, take tax the of, food. Yeah, they would tax the food. That's how they would do yeah. it. Yeah, no, the tithe. It was food. Yeah. So he's taxing this and, and gathering up everything else. Uh, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food, food in the cities. And so what, uh, what they would do is, all the fields around there would bring all the food into that city and store it. Yeah. Do uh, you have any other, did you bring pictures of the storehouses of Joseph thingy? I, I yeah. So they found in Egypt these things, and they were... They like were giant cisterns. Yeah, they were cisterns, and... With, with like a hole at the top. It was like the, like a covered well, and it was just a great big, huge underground silo. silo. Yeah, and, the, and they yeah. just brought it and dumped it in there until there was yeah, full of it. But they were all over. They are all over. Yeah. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not. The goal is to survive. The goal is not to be ended. <laughs> the goal, yeah, it, because I always not. thought, well, it's twenty percent, man. Yeah, that's good. But you know, everybody else is coming to you. You, you know, it, everyone's going to lose weight. Everybody, <laughs> but everybody. you're going to survive it. Yeah. Uh, the word for perish in the Bible—it's a great word study. Is it's you can come back from death, but you don't come back from perishing. Perishing is the ultimate death. So when it says to a Christian, he got Jesus will say. Whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He shall never die, or whatever. Uh, but whenever the word perish, he says, we'll, we'll die, but we'll never perish. And so when he says that the land perish not, he's pulling out the big word. You know, we're going to get close to death, 
but we're not going to be wiped off the face of the earth. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And remember, his servants are all educated, uh, priestly class. They're all going like this. They're all going, yeah, that's a good thing to do. Let's do that. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the spirit of Elohim is? Ruha Elohim. This is the same wow. Ruha Elohim used in Genesis 1 2. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I think Pharaoh would get it. And Pharaoh said, now remember, he's, he's, this is one of the kings of the East, Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. He's a Hyksos, so they might have some knowledge of the Elohim. Mm-hmm. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. He was just saying words. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Do you see how fast he made that decision? That's why he's Pharaoh. That's why he's Pharaoh. Now, this is the first mention of the word throne, if anybody cares. Oh. Because I do. Yeah. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now, I do want to look at, this is funny. Uh, but over in Genesis 45, 8, uh, Joseph says, So now it, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God hath made me the lord of all Egypt. Here Pharaoh says, I have made thee, uh, I've set thee over all the land of Egypt. But, but Joseph knows. He knows. This is a God thing. Yeah. This is a God thing. So Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. And the word here is his signet ring. And when he did that, this is what happened in the room. <gasps> it's seriously. The, the... You got a text. No, I said seriously. So when he took off the seal ring, this, and gave it to Joseph, it signified that Joseph was the governor. Um, the words used are Prime Minister, Grand Vizier, and Viceroy. You know, Viceroy from Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, so he gives him this, and he puts it upon his hands, and arrays him in vestures of fine linen. That's the word shesh. Remember we talked about bisis? Yeah. This is, this is the Egyptian fine linen. The best clothes that he's ever worn. Best clothes that anybody's worn. Mm. And put a gold chain upon his neck. Big heavy one. So when you have a change of station... Change your clothes. Amen. When he moved from the dungeon, changed his clothes to stand before Pharaoh, changed his clothes to rule over Egypt. You can tell a person's station in life by their clothes. I wear an orange I know, I'm this like I'm close to the dungeon. All right. <laughs> the word for necklace is also important because it's dress for success. <laughs> yeah, well, hmm. The word for necklace is also uh, interesting. It's a gold chain. Put a gold chain upon his neck. That's significant because it is a badge of his office. Yes. Not a lot of people wore a gold chain, and it it symbolized to the people that he was who he says he was. I would have put Pharaoh's ring on the chain and hung it around my neck. Like Frodo. (laughs) Like Frodo. Verse 43. Oh, and it says here, it says... uh, Yeah. It says, and he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. Yes. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land oh. of Egypt. Wow. Do you remember who this was? This is from the book of Esther. It reminds me of Haman. Yeah, Haman from the book of Esther. <coughs> we don't have what, time for what, that. What shall, what shall he do for someone he delights in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want you to see this. This is cool, too. It says, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. It's only three words in the Hebrew. Nathan, Aretz, Mitzrayim, Mm -hmm. which is gave, I talked about that earlier, gave land of Egypt. Egypt. Literally, he gave him the land of Egypt. (laughs) Take care of us. Be our savior. Seriously. That's literally what he said. You got to get us through this. Yeah, nobody else can. These drink... These dreams terrified Pharaoh. What if you had a dream? Let's just say you had a dream. Are you gonna like look at the 
some guy, you tell him your dream, he tells you the interpretation of it, and you're like, whoa, dude, dude, you're second in command. You tell me when to when to go out and when to come in, and you tell me what to eat. You be my father. You be yeah, you be my father, and you you be in charge of my entire country based mm-hmm. upon one dream, two dreams, double in a night. Mm-hmm. The fact that none of the magicians could do it and just say, you know. Amazing. Yeah, God was in this. Yes. Verse 44, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. That's not all I am. <laughs> and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. I've spoken it. Done. Done. Verse 45, and Pharaoh called Joseph name, Joseph's name Zaphnath Paaneah. Because if you get a change of clothes, you also change your name. And he gave him to wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. He got busy right away. Now, Zaphnath Pianea means... We're not sure. So You interpreted my dream and now you're in charge. <laughs> one guy said the treasury of the glory rest. Yeah. Egyptian scholars said savior of the age. Mm-hmm. The Hebrews, who are always wonky, sorry guys, your Mishra stinks. Mishnah, revealer of secrets, no. no not One guy it. said the God who speaks and lives, no. It wasn't until really close to getting everything prepared, I found something. The guy was very clear just the way he said it. I'm like, okay, that's right. Zap means abundance. NT. NT means of, of, zap, nap, uh, P-A means the, and A-N-E-A means life, abundance of life. He came to give life abundantly. He came to give life abundantly. Shut up. Shut up. (laughs) Bam! He's a type of Christ. (laughs) He came to give life and life more abundantly. Yes, he did. And to prevent you from perishing. Just trust him. Just trust him. Do what he says and live. (laughs) The bread of life. All right. So, so, so. That's fantastic. Now, Pharaoh takes care of a couple things. He gives him to wife Asenath. Yeah, because you gotta you gotta have a wife of the goddess Neith, who is the goddess of war and hunting. But what's interesting about this is. Joseph is a little Hebrew, and he's scum of the earth, and you can put chains on him, it doesn't matter, but if he marries into the priest class, that raises him up to the highest class That's in right. Egypt. Yeah, you, you've, got to, you've got to fix the fact that he's a Hebrew, or no one's going to listen to him. Or nobody's going to listen to but him. But if you put him in the family of the priest of On, you've, yeah. you've done a lot here. So what is On? On it, uh, I'm not going to do that one yet. All right, Potiphera. 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 So there's a guy named Potiphera we learned about. Now there's a guy named Potiphera. Potiphera was a captain of the guard. We know he was from the priest class because all the officers were of the priest class. All of them were. This guy is also a priest. This guy, because his name is Potiphera, probably came from the city of On, also known as Heliopolis, because they worshipped... This particular god, he remember his name means the gift of Ra, the gift of Ra, the gift of the sun god, the gift of the sun god. The sun god was worshipped in Heliopolis, the sun city. So, Potiphera, Potiphar is actually a shortened form of Potiphera. There is a very, very, very good chance he married that he Potiphar's married daughter. Potiphar's daughter and became son-in-law to Potiphar's wife. <laughs> Worst mother-in-law ever. <laughs> so Potiphar, this is actually a guy saying this. Now, he did not say Potiphera, the priest. He said Potiphar, this was back a couple chapters ago, signifies one devoted to the sun, the local deity of On, or Heliopolis, mm-hmm. uh, a circumstance which fixes the place of his residence in the delta, talking about Potiphar. I think it's the same guy. I think it's the same guy. So, so that, And you know what? It would work. It would so work. Because I'm sure... You kind of wonder... Now, here's why you... Now, if I was Pharaoh, why would I give him Potiphar's daughter? Well, it kind of does help to bring that... Fa- First off, Joseph may have asked. 
Joseph may have asked for as as a gift. He may have already known this girl. He because he's at the house. He's at the house he's all the time. He's at the house all the time, right? Yeah. Um, so also to smooth out any grudges with Potiphar, you smooth out because this How you is smooth out. You're gonna this because is actually the, he's not marrying into Potiphar's family. Potiphar's marrying into the guy who's second in command. Right. It's a it's a up move for Potiphar. Yeah. And it's and of course what you and it makes his mother in law very happy because now oh yes I've known Joseph for a long time <laughs> so so there's a, a weird little uh, uh, when the Jews do their Mishnah in their their interpretations of the Bible there's a thing called the law of the converse, the law of conservation of biblical personalities so Whoa. so they're so close they're so close it's got to be the same guy otherwise you're having two people so they, they they want it to become one they want it to be the same guy well yeah so anyway all right and so there's a good reason to keep so, separated so where is on here's cairo here's on and here's the land of goshen not over i always thought it was up here mm -hmm. it, the land of goshen is over here where the jews are going to settle what the hebrews once they come in yeah all right all right, we're we're gonna we're trying to finish up here. All right, so yeah, by eight o'clock. No, <laughs> you only got twenty more verses to go. <laughs> All right, Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Of course, Moses mentions this because wow, he's such a young guy. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Didn't he just say well, that? You know, Joseph Jesus started his ministry when he was thirty. <laughs> I didn't. I missed that one. <laughs> So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt in verse 45, and now he went throughout all the land of Egypt in verse 46. Guess what Joseph's doing? He's getting busy. Oh, he is he's really setting up officers. Oh. He's building those silos. He knows exactly what he needs to do. Boom. All right, now we're going to come to the first summary. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. If this is your food, you're going to need it in seven years. Boom. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without numbering. Because at first it was, okay, two bushels, three bushels, four bushels, five bushels. Billion and a half bushels. You know what? We don't have time to bushel. We don't have for that. And unto and he goes he looks at the scribe who was in charge of counting and tallying, he goes, You're fired. Yeah. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. So during this seven year period, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, or Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house, Yikes. which Manasseh just means cause to forget. Yeah. Cause to forget. It's sad. Cause to forget, yeah. Because he finally got through it. He finally got over it. God, God blessed him, and he healed him. Verse 52, And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. The word Ephraim is actually a double word. So there's a word for Bethlehem, Ephrata? Yeah. Back where his mom died? Yeah. If you double it, it's Ephraim. What do you mean double it? The em at the end, if you pluralize Ephrata to the plural form of two Ephraim, it means double fruit for double fruitful, the double land. Yeah, if you take Ephrata mm. and double it for and if you take that's where his mom died, Bethlehem. Yeah. And, uh, and so he was thinking about her, but uh, it's actually the word for ash heap, and so it means two ash heaps, uh, or places of double fruitfulness. There's actually a hint at the word twin, which makes you go, what? Manasseh and Ephraim, and, and they do say that there's a, quite a possibility because we do have some twins, Jacob and Esau and Perez and Zerah of Tamar. It runs in the family. Yeah, so, and that's this here. Uh, and the seven years of plentiness, verse 53, that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now we're going to do the summary. And the seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands 
all of all the parts of Egypt. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So, so all the areas around will get it. And this is when all the land... Which is funny, okay, and I just got to say this. This is how it always works. Everybody knows that over in Egypt, they're, tr they're putting away 20%. Because some crazy guy told them to put away 20%. Why is he? They're idiots. <laughs> and now it's time to pay the piper. I mean, yeah. But that always happens. What, what do you call that? Those guys who store up all the time? The preppers? The preppers. <laughs> but, I mean, they're looking at it and they're thinking, you're crazy. We're blessed. We're blessed. They live in yeah, the yeah. now. What are you doing building a big boat for? <laughs> yeah. It always happens that God's people are prepared and the rest of the world just keeps on going. Yeah. They know it's happening. You couldn't, this was not a secret. There's no way that There's this no was kept this a secret. That's great. That's good. Mm. All right. And uh, let's see, verse 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh <laughs> said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph. What he saith to you, do. That's because he's discreet and wise. <sighs> and the famine was over all the face of the earth. And it's just talking about like all the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now, here's a thought though. Um, they taxed them 20%. But when it says way over yonder and let them gather all the food of those good years, the idea, uh, some of the commentators said, and I think I agree with it, was that the government also said let's buy up some extra. So oh, yeah. we're getting our tax of 20%. We've got that, and that's more than 20% of, yeah. of a normal year. That's what you do. But you know what? You know what? As the government, we've got lots of money put aside. Mm. We're very wealthy. We're going to spend that on getting on. So now when he's selling it to all these countries round about for a profit, that makes sense. he's m increasing the wealth of Egypt. Do you guys remember about six months ago, I think it was about six months ago, the price for a barrel of oil went negative? For yes. the first time in forever. I mean, it literally went from three pennies to one penny to zero to negative. It was the first time ever. Yeah. And it was literally one penny or zero for a barrel of oil. And Trump said to his guys, go fill up all of our strategic reserve tanks. Every one of them. Same for, thing. For basically for free. Same thing. Basically for basically for free. free. So that's all we got, guys. Sorry we went a little bit late, but wow. You can hit pause. Yeah. You can and come pause. back to it. Yeah. Of course, we didn't tell you that until the end. But hopefully you thought of it. So <laughs> this, this whole chapter is about being prepared, yeah, being wise, and God letting his people know what he's going to do before he does it. Yeah. It's this is the this is the go to the ant thou slugger, consider you know, consider her ways and be wise. She has no ruler yeah. or whatever, she's storing yeah. up everything. Yeah. Be ready for well, for the day that someone calls you up. Yeah, yeah. It's always being ready and being prepped and in and, and what to do. You know, when you go before Pharaoh, don't go in all dirty. You know, you want to you want to go in, go with a plan. Yeah, yeah. Going for your job interview, go in looking nice. Go with a plan. He got the job. Yay! All right, ready to go. All right, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, wonderful chapter. Very long chapter. It's the second longest chapter we've looked at so far. Uh, we pray, Father, it was a blessing, and we'll see you again on uh, uh, just whatever. We'll see everybody on Tuesday. May we have a good Thanksgiving this week. Amen. Amen.